So I came across this article. It's a good thing most women don't want to date Trump voters. Now the Washington Post has joined a campaign to shame women for having the bare minimum no Trump voters standard. This should be good. It's an amusing truth that comes up with regularity. Men who love Donald Trump struggle on the dating market. This is neither surprising nor regrettable. Supporting Trump is much like refusing to bathe, blowing your nose in your hands, or farting loudly on purpose. It's a repugnant habit that makes you repulsive to normal people. The whole point of dating and marriage is to find happiness, not to spend the rest of one's days suffering in silence while the, the races you live with cackles over Greg Gutfeld's um, latest hateful diatribe disguised as comedy. This should be common sense. Yet our sexist culture remains too enamored by the stories of female self-sacrifice to accept that it's just fine if Trump voters never get laid. <laughs> Even people who should really know better have taken to bullying liberal women for their refusal to date male Trump voters. Now this quote, if attitudes don't shift, a political dating mismatch will threaten marriage, declared a recent headline of a Washington Post column by the editorial board. To make it even grosser, the op-ed was published the day before Thanksgiving, as if to arm concerned relatives who plan to spend the holidays pestering single women at dinner over when they'll get serious about finding a husband. In this unsigned essay, the authors fret that the ideological divide between young men and women is preventing Gen Z, who range from the age of 9 to 27, from getting married. Women under 30 are far more likely to be liberal than men who are far more likely to identify as conservative, citing data showing that Democratic voters generally refuse to date Trump voters. The Post editors argue that people should be more willing to date across party lines and to, um, learn to appreciate alternative um, perspectives that may seem odd or offensive. Just, just go with it, even if it's offensive. The op-ed presents as if this entreaty to date across party lines, as if it's generalized advice being offered to both men and women, and both Republicans and Democrats. But of course, it's aimed primarily, if not exclusively, at Democratic voting women. The polling data shows that most Republicans are already willing to date Democrats, which makes sense, since Democrats make more attractive partners. It's mostly Democrats and, though, and mostly women who decline to date those from the other party. Adding further insult to injury, the editorial board cites right-wing sociologist Brad Wilcox, who is set to publish yet another in a long list of books that treat compulsory heterosexual marriage as a panacea for all social evils. Wilcox has a shady history of tying anti-gay and uh, has a shady history of ties to anti-gay advocacy. Disturbingly, he once argued that marriage prevents DV. In reality, marriage just traps women in relationships with their abusers. In trying to sell women on this marry men who repulse you plan, the editorial board unconvincingly argues that simply being married makes people happier than being single. But while it may be true that married people, even those in politically mixed marriages, report higher levels of happiness than single people, it, it doesn't follow that the wedding ring is the reason. Most Americans marry for love after all. Being married to someone you wanted to marry is very different than what is being suggested here, lowering your standards just to get married. Yes, we're not doing that anymore. To be a bit crass about it, think about it this way. Two women buy a pair of shoes. The first one is allowed to try on every pair in the store until she finds one that fit well and look good on her. The other woman buys the first pair on the rack without even checking if it's her size. Which woman do you think would be happier with her purchase a week from now? And choosing who you marry has even more impact on your life. Absolutely. The whole idea is choice. Democratically voting women, hey, can be in a um, relationship. We can even be in a relationship that pe with people who don't fall in line 100% with our beliefs. We get to choose though. We get to opt in and opt out. Marrying a Trump voter isn't just a matter of minor political differences or expecting someone to be exactly like yourself. For women in particular, it's about being able to be safe and respected inside your own home, which is a very minimum standard all people deserve. 
Voting for Trump means backing a man who has been accused of S.A. by two dozen women and who a judge and jury deemed responsible for rape. It means backing the man who repeatedly brags he got Roe v. Wade overturned. In, in addition, the MAGA media consumed by most Republicans is hardly neutral on the question of sexism. But of course, women's happiness is not actually the concern of the Washington Post editorial board. The more serious argument comes from their insistence that cross-political marriages will help save the nation from Trump era divisions and social ills stemming from men's misogyny. Basically, it's a gussied up version of the classic Beauty and the Beast fantasy where a woman's love can turn the brute into a prince. It's cruel on its face to expect women to give up their own happiness in hopes that it can turn a red hat into a better man through patience and love. But it's also a false hope. It's hard to get anyone to change their minds about politics, trying to get men who already think women are women are inferior to listen to their liberal wives is a joke. She continues with, I have a small sliver of sympathy for the frustration that drives this asinine hope that pity marriages for Trump voters will save us from the mega threat. It's calling that nothing seems to wake Trump voters up from their fascist stupor. Reason doesn't change them. Evidence has no impact, compassion or decency. We've tried appealing to their better angels for years and all we get is cry harder lives. In the face of this MAGA unwillingness to suck less, there can be comfort in the twilight style fantasies that the monster can be made into a man by a woman's loving touch, but it's simply not real. Worse, it shifts the responsibility for male misbehavior onto women. The blame for MAGA is subtly moving away from the, from the ones who are perpetuating the problem, meaning Trump's predominantly male voters onto the women. Absolutely. We're not here for that. Y'all can go ahead and keep that and let the men take care of themselves. More than a few of my liberal leaning women have talked about how these conservatives still come on to them, knowing that they vote blue, that they're feminists, that they, you know, have opinions and vote and stuff. And what one woman or a few women that I've seen in the comments, they suggested it's more of a it's taming the shrew, you know, taking a woman who they see and just wanting to domesticate her because she's just this wild, crazy woman. When there is no shortage of pick me women that are waiting, you know, pick me, pick me to be a traditional wife. You see these women, they are available, but these men don't want the traditional women. They want to tame the liberal feminist woman. And so um, to piggyback off the other article that I was doing where democratically voting women do not want these men. So now I'm going to talk about this. The insidious rise of trad wives, a right-wing fantasy is rotting young men's minds. There is serious money in peddling fantasies of female submission online, but it may be exacerbating male loneliness. If the average American were asked what they imagine priorities of the feminist movement are these days, most people would likely cite concerns like fighting slim abortion bans, getting justice for SA victims, or boring mainstays like equal pay for equal work. But if you listen to the world of right-wing social media influencers, they have a different answer. To them, feminists are single-mindedly obsessed with destroying women who identify as trad wives. I will say this, I am a feminist and I simply do not care what trad wives are doing. Go be a trad wife if you want to. I'm just a regular wife. All right, trad wives are triggering feminists according to YouTube channel for Daily Wire contributor, Brett, um, Brett Cooper, who has 3.75 million subscribers. Trad wives are triggering us. Most trad wives online are far more girl boss than even most outspoken feminists. Angry feminists, compares trad wives to neo smotsies and um, quite supremacists, screams the headline from the YouTube channel for Michael Knowles, a far-right troll with 1.75 million subscribers. This video is triggering all the feminists, declares the headline of a defense of trad wives from um, right-wing grifter Amala Ekpunobi, who has 1.7 million subscribers. Trad wife is internet slang for the traditional wife. It's largely a social media trend of conventionally attractive 
white women putting out TikToks um, and videos gush, uh, gushing about the joys of submissive marriage and modesty. <laughs> modesty. Though notably, this modest clothing often leaves little to the imagination. If you guys see some of these trad wives, they wake up and their makeup is impeccable. They have these little pinup dresses. They wake up and they literally look like they came out of a colorized version of a of a sitcom. And I'm like, I'm a I've been a wife for almost ten years and. Uh, on no occasion, on zero occasions, do I wake up, get fully dressed up in a beautiful dress and some heels and a full face of makeup. It just doesn't happen. I put on some lipstick. I know how to put on lipstick. I do not know how to put on a full face of makeup simply to wash dishes and clean up. It's just, I just can't do it. It's a neat marketing trick from trad wives to position themselves as a dangerous threat that feminists are desperate to take out. It helps sell the central lucrative fantasy to um, credulous audiences that female submission is a woman's natural desire, one that is being stolen from them, <laughs> from sinister feminist forces, and that you, male viewer, would be gifted with a compliant helpmeet of your very own, if not for those dastardly feminists. But these brave women of YouTube, with their picture perfect makeup and slender but curvy physiques, will stand up. Um, to those B words and restore your birthright. A smoking hot 22 year old housewife who never talks back, never gets tired, never says no, never gains weight, no matter how many children she has. It must be nice to be able to have all these kids stay 22 and stay beautiful no matter if they're sleep deprived or anything. There's been much debate over whether or not corn, especially the ubiquitous online corn of our modern era, is damaging young men. What this discussion tends to overlook is there's a huge swath of online material about SEX and relationships that presents over-the-top sexist fantasies disguised as reality. Trad wife content is some of the most pernicious. Unlike corn, which positions itself as fantasy, most of the women creating trad wife content online claim it's a window into their real lives. Even though if you ask any real housewives, you'll find few if find it necessary to put on a full face of makeup, get a professional blowout and don a push-up bra in order to wash dishes. Absolutely. Absolutely not. Talk to real wives. Who looks like this? No doubt there's been a robust feminist response to the proliferation of trad wife content online. Most criticisms, however, start with the assumption that the audience for this content is primarily, if not exclusively, female. In some cases, especially with feeds that feature actual housework and cooking tips, that might be true. But many of these videos marketed as trad wife has, have a strong whiff of the male gaze to them. Some shamelessly serve cheesecake while pretending at modesty. Others like Classically Abby by Ben Shapiro's trad wife sister, Abigail Roth, adopt a smug debate me bro tone. It cuts against their claims due to demure femininity, but definitely appeals to men who are eager to hear a, wo a woman ramble about how feminism is bad. So it is that, um, that laundering of a male voice, an anti-feminist voice through a woman's mouth. And so in this article, they also share other, they share trad wives content. I'm not going to edify, I'm not going to prop up any of this propaganda because that's simply what this is. It is propaganda and it's not reality, but it pushes this notion that this is available or these types of women are available to men. And that is going to create um, a divide, even more of a divide because these women are not real. I mean, they're real, they're real people, but this is not how wives are. This is not reality for most of us actual wives. So this coupled with the debates about child-free versus um, have all these kids, is just going to continue to create, you know, like going at each other when we really could just be okay with choices. Y'all go ahead and let me know what you think about this one. Don't forget to comment, like, comment, share. So this woman asked this question in the Black Lady subreddit. She says, I don't understand the whole child-free versus kids thing. 
I'm not sure if I've been under a rock or what, but why are people arguing about this? Why isn't it just have them if you want and don't if you don't want to? Okay, now this conversation has been going on for a while. And just to put it out there, I am a mother of two. I have been married almost, um, it'll be 10 years this month. And I was a child-free woman and single up until the age of 33. I'm sorry, I had a kid at 34. So I have been um, on both sides and understand both sides of the equation. Also, I am in Reddit at Bourbon Bougie. So if you ever want me to see anything, you can tag my name and I will get to it. Anyways, my answer to this, the birth rate is dropping globally and women aren't relegated to the boxes of wife and mom anymore. Religion and patriarchy has substantial control over women in our former titles. Now women are asserting some independence and control over our own lives. And the men are losing their minds. Leaders are losing their minds. Um, Child-free women out here looking refreshed, traveling, thriving. And people don't want other women, young girls, young ladies, to look at these other videos of women doing so well and not fitting into the trope of, the sad cat lady. They can't have these women out here being the rich auntie with no kids and living fabulous because that would destroy the narrative that single and child-free women are just crying into their bedspread, crying into their degrees because they don't have a man to hold at night. No, they have been able to control narratives for so long because women haven't been telling their stories. And now that women are telling their stories, um, the powers that be, the leaders, the people that want to uphold patriarchy have to like put them back into the box or at least shape the narrative that they are bitter, sad, and lonely. This woman says, every time I say I don't want kids, the question is always why? And I do need to let y'all know that people do not have to answer this question. Um, Nerd Queen says, this is the answer. The amount of elders who tell me I'm going to change my mind about having kids is astounding especially when I'm 37 and have maintained this stance since childhood. I'm not opposed to adoption or dating someone with kids, but I do not want to give birth. Folks need to mind their own crotch and worry about themselves. The next person says, yep, people have been getting judged for not wanting them. Men saying women who say they don't are just kidding themselves. And so child free, um, child free peeps have gone ham in response. Absolutely. People that are pushing back are pushing back because other folks are trying to paint them in a way that isn't true. Like these people who have kids and expect everybody to have kids keep trying to paint child-free people in a negative light. They're just so sad. They're going to change their mind. They don't know what they're talking about. And so I understand child-free people pushing back against that narrative. For a long time, a woman's primary role was considered to get married, have babies in that order. Since a majority of women subscribed to this paradigm, there was no issue. But currently, the number of women opting out of these roles has drastically, um, drastically and sharply increased, which is a threat to the status quo. So now it's an issue. Absolutely. And then this next person says, <laughs> people are nosy as F. Absolutely. Succinct. Very succinct. This person says, eh, I'm at the age where kids, where the kid questions are nearly done. Well, at least I thought so until my 40 plus year old stepsister had her first. So questions about more grands are all of a sudden popping up again. But I know I've been grilled about kids by friends, family and coworkers. I think it's a generational thing, though. Younger people I speak to do not question me about the no kid thing, nor do they assume that I have kids. Cool. We need this to go away. We need to be comfortable with thinking that women know their bodies and what they want to do with themselves. It's perfectly fine to say no or opt out. Opt in, opt out. Do what you want to do, but do it how you want to do it, not because um, society paints us into these boxes. This person says, I think it's a lot of people on both sides who feel insecure about where they landed. That and people just really like thinking they can change someone's opinion. I'm included in that. I guess if you're concerned about underpopulation or overpopulation, it matters. But beyond that, why would you care what someone else does with their body in life? And for those concerned about childless people, most of us could be parents at any point if we really want to. Well beyond childbearing years, adoption and fostering exists. 
Same thing with people who are happy being single. Single old people can hook up with other single old people so you can stop worrying about other people's loneliness. I don't think that people who are simply living their lives and pushing back against the narratives are necessarily insecure. They just are saying, why are you, t why are you um, giving judgment on my life? I don't think that they're really insecure. I think that they're fine and people keep in trying to impose their opinion on their lives, even when it's unsolicited. So this person says, bartender here, I would get asked this all the effing time. I got into a heated argument with some um, a-hole who asked me, who asked me, didn't I think I was selfish for not wanting kids? I told him it's more selfish to bring children into this world that I don't want because he said so. He said the population was decreasing. I told him there are 8 billion people and the fate of humanity has nothing to do with me. I got a, a lot of you'll change your mind when you're older. So I counter with why do you think you know my mind better than me or my personal favorite? Would you say the same thing to a man who is my age? And so this is this perfectly speaks to why child free women because you know that child free men are not getting the same question. This is why child free women push back so hard because how dare you random person think that you know my life? How dare you think that you know why um, or how I should feel or how I will feel in the future random person? And why do these random people think that they should argue? Why do you think you should argue that people should have kids and being selfish for not, it is not selfish to not want to have kids. It is selfish to bring kids into this world when you don't actively and enthusiastically want them. Children deserve parents that actively and enthusiastically choose to be parents, not that are forced to be parents because of societies and societal um, pressure. Y'all go ahead, let me know what you think about this conversation. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.